of our series entitled, Get Up and Lead. Uh, over the last several weeks and for the next few, we're going to be examining several key leadership qualities that you find in the life of a person of impact and influence. And we're examining all of these leadership qualities from a biblical perspective. In week one, we talked about influence. In week two, we talked about self-discipline. And I had somebody come to me and said, man, you were all over my toes in that message on self-discipline. And I said, well, we gave you a survey and told you guys to tell us what you wanted to talk about, and you chose self-discipline. It was number one on the list. So you asked for it, literally, you asked for it. Attitude was number three in the survey. It was the third most requested topic in the survey. And I, I really believe you made an incredible choice when you said, let's hear more about attitude. Because more than anything else, attitude will determine your success in life. Attitude, and I'm not the first person to say this, attitude is more important than your aptitude. And aptitude is simply your skill set. It's your gifts. It is what you're good at. But your attitude is more important than your attitude when it comes to your impact and fulfillment in life. Now, when you look in the dictionary, there are a lot of different slants or meanings to the word attitude, and I'm just going to point out three of them today. The most common one, number one, a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something typically reflected in a person's behavior. So I want you to pay attention to that. The definition says that an attitude is a certain way of thinking. That is important because that's how the Bible talks about attitude. An attitude is a way of thinking, a pattern of thinking. So your attitude is how you think about things. So the way to change your attitude is to change your thinking. A second definition of attitude is this, a position of the body proper to or implying action or mental state. In other words, this is body posture. So as a, as a, as a communicator, I, I call it nonverbals. When I'm talking to a room, I can usually tell whether or not what I'm saying is connecting with people or not by reading their nonverbals. I, 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 their, their body posture reflects the attitude of how they are interacting with what I'm saying. Your body posture often reflects your attitude towards something. A third definition has to do with aviation, and we're actually going to talk about that a little more in just a moment, but this is it. The orientation of an aircraft relative to the direction of flight. Airplanes on the instrument panel, one of those little gauges on that instrument panel of an airplane is an attitude indicator, and it shows the plane's position in relation to the ground. So the plane either has a nose-up attitude, a nose-level attitude, or a nose-down attitude. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. It's impossible for me to overstate the impact of attitude on a person's life. Outside of your relationship with Jesus, there is probably no other factor that will determine your success or failure in life more than your attitude. And you probably noticed, like I have, that attitudes run in groups. In other words, certain attitudes attract certain people with similar attitudes. And you often see attitudes being passed down from one generation of a family to another, so much so that families are known by their attitudes. Matter of fact, we talk about the Hatfields and the McCoys. They were two fighting families, and the Hatfields had one set of attitudes, and the McCoys had another set of attitudes, and their fights among each other were so legendary that anytime there are families that are at odds with each other, we'll say they're squabbling like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Families have distinctive attitudes. Businesses have distinctive attitudes. Restaurants, airlines, churches, they all have a certain set of attitudes. Now, what I want you to do for, for the moment, just let what Paul has to say in Romans 12 just kind of be the framework for our conversation. Paul says a lot in Romans 12, but one of the things he does is he addresses the issue of our attitude. Listen to this, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. Some traditional translations say by the renewing of your mind, by changing the way you think. 
Now, an attitude is a way of thinking. So Paul is saying, let God transform you into a new person by changing your attitude. And here's what will happen. Then you will learn to know God's good will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You can't miss what Paul is saying here. He's warning us not to copy the world's way of thinking. As a follower of Christ, do not take on the world's attitude, but instead be transformed. The word for transform here, and I'm not trying to sound highly educated or really important, but I want you to know this. What Paul originally wrote, we're reading in the English. He originally wrote it in the Greek. We're reading a translation. But the Greek word that he originally chose for the transform word we use in English is called metamorpho. That's the Greek word. And it's obvious that's where we get our English word for metamorphosis. And what Paul is saying is let God completely change you. Let there be a total transformation in your life. Let God morph you by changing the way you think, by giving you a new attitude. The bottom line is this. When you come to Christ, he does change the way you think. He dramatically rewires your brain, which means there should be a change in your attitude attitude. Jesus changes the way you relate to everything. And notice the result of that change. Here is the result of a renewed mind and a changed attitude. Verse 12b or verse 2b. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's absolutely no no way that you will have a certainty about God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life without being transformed, without having your mind renewed and your attitude changed. And the more Jesus works on you, the more he transforms you, the more he changes your patterns of thinking, therefore your attitude, the more clear the good, perfect, and pleasing will of God will be in your life. Now what you have to know, there's a lot of people talk about attitude. But what you have to know what the difference between the new age way of talking about attitude where it's some Eastern religious mind over matter thing and what I'm saying and what Paul is saying here is our attitude should be reflective of the active power of God's grace at work in our life. If you're truly a child of God, and you're truly being transformed by grace, then you won't copy the culture's behavioral patterns or other people's attitudes and ways of thinking. Instead, your rewired and renewed mind can conform to biblical attitudes that enable you to know the good and pleasing and perfect will of God, which is gonna bring the most fruit and impact and fulfillment to our lives. John Maxwell, in a book called The Winning Attitude, made this incredible statement. It's an incredibly articulate way of talking about attitude. Listen to what he says. Attitude, it is the advanced man of our true selves. Its roots are inward, but its fruit is outward. It is our best friend or our worst enemy. It is more honest and more consistent than our words. It is an outward look based on past experience experiences. It is a thing that draws people to us or repels them. It is never content until it is expressed. It is the librarian of our past. It is the speaker of our present. It is the prophet of our future. There's an old saying about bad attitudes and it goes like this. Your attitude is like a flat tire. You're not going anywhere until you change it. A bad attitude, a negative attitude will destroy your career aspirations, your family life, your spiritual hopes. Literally everything that matters in your life can be undermined by a bad attitude because everything is impacted by your attitude. President Thomas Jefferson said, nothing can stop the man with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal. Nothing on earth can help the man with a wrong mental attitude. Now, there's so much I could say over the next few moments about your attitude, but let me just give you a few biblical truths. I had to cut a whole lot of stuff out of this, but let me just leave you with a few biblical truths about attitude. Number one, we choose our attitudes. That's right. Your attitude is a choice. Every one of us is responsible for our own attitude regardless of what is going on in our life. In my previous or my first pastorate, I pastored a man by the name of Richard. He was one of the elders in our church. He had been an incredible 
uh, scholarship athlete in, in, in college and went on to become a very successful businessman. At the age of 40, Richard started noticing some of the use of his limbs and some deterioration and loss of certain body functions only to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And I watched this incredibly large, capable man wither away in front of me, right before my eyes. And honestly, it was one of the saddest things I have ever seen. And at the same time, it was one of the most encouraging things that I had ever seen. Richard never let his physical struggles impact his mental and spiritual health. And and one day I just asked him, I said, Richard, how do you do this? I mean, how do you stay so upbeat? You're one of the most positive, best attitudes I've ever seen while you're dealing with this debilitating illness. How do you do it? And I said, is it because of your faith? And he said, well, pastor, can we have an honest conversation? And I said, sure. He said, for sure. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And I have no doubt that my faith in Jesus impacts my outlook on life. But he said, I know a lot of people of faith that share the same faith I do that are bitter and critical and cynical and have bad attitudes over far less than what I'm struggling with. So there has to be more than my faith because I share a faith with some people who don't have the same outlook on life that I do. And I said, well, Richard, then what is it? If, if, there's, if, there, if it's not just faith, your walk with Christ, then what is it? And he said, I would have to say it has to do with my attitude. I made a choice a long time ago that I wasn't going to let anything steal my joy. And I knew that my attitude was my choice. So I chose joy and I choose a positive attitude regardless what is going on. Now, Richard's health caused him to have to rotate and step off of our board. And when he did, we gave him a plaque with a statement from Charles Swindoll on it, and and this is what it said. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. Life is 10% what happens to me, and 90% how I react to it. And if I ever met a man that embodied that statement, it was Richard. We choose our attitudes. Truth number two. Your attitude isn't dictated by people or circumstances. Like Richard said, there are people of faith who let their circumstances determine their attitude and ultimately they let their circumstances and attitudes determine the direction of their life. Whether you are happy or cranky, whether you have a good attitude or a bad attitude, both attitudes are contagious and both attitudes are indicators of a person's spiritual depth. And if there was ever a person who let her situation not control her faith, it was Corey Tim Boom. She's written several books. The most common or the most well-known is author of The Hiding Place. And, and it is, if I talk today about her and you're like, well, I don't know about Corey and I would like to read more, then the first book you ought to pick up is The Hiding Place. And there are several others. Her and her sister Betsy were Jewish young ladies who were followers of Jesus They were imprisoned in concentration camps under Hitler's rule during Germany's reign of Europe or attempted rule of Europe. And Corey and Betsy sought to find blessings in the middle of their horrific situations. Here's one of her statements. Happiness isn't something that depends on our surroundings. And she later wrote, it's something we make inside ourselves. Along with her sister Betsy, Uh, Corey was forced to sleep on straw-covered platforms in filthy prison barracks where the sewage had backed up into the barracks. It was overcrowded. The stitch was unbearable. Fleas had infested the area. And one day, I mean, these were girls whose father had owned a business. They had a, what would be considered a, a, an upper middle class life. And then all of a sudden, they're thrown in these prison barracks. And Corey asked her sister, Betsy, How can we survive in this place? And Betsy just stopped and prayed out loud in that moment that God would show them how to survive. And in her book, The Hiding Place, Corey writes about that conversation. And Betsy says, Corey, in the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that part again. I glanced down the long dim aisle to make sure no guard was in sight, then drew the Bible from its pouch. It was 1 Thessalonians, Betsy. That's where we read this morning. Oh, yes, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances. That's it, Corey. That's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's how we survive here. 
At that point, the two sisters started making thing, a mental gratitude list. That's what they called it. Things that even in that prison barrack and in the harshness of that concentration camp, they could be grateful for. Number one on their list is they thank God that they had been assigned to the same concentration camp together. They could have been split up. Number two, they thank God that they were able to sneak a copy of the scripture past the inspectors and the prison guards. They were honored and glad to have their Bible. Number two, even though the, or number three, even though the room was unsafely overcrowded and crammed, they thanked God because it meant that every time they read their Bibles and talk about Jesus, others overheard them talking about Jesus. And they continued making this list. And at the end of their mental gratitude list, Corey's writing continued. Thus began the closest, most joyous weeks of all the time in Ravensbrook. In the sanctuary of God's fleas, Betsy and I ministered the word of God to all in the room. We sat by deathbeds that came, became doorways to heaven. We watched women who had lost everything grow rich in hope. We prayed beyond the concrete walls for the healing of Germany, Europe, and the world. Betsy died in that prison camp. But Corey survived, went on to write dozens of books about her experience. And there are so many of her quotes that reveal this incredible attitude that her and her sister had in the harsh realities of that. And some of those quotes are so common, you've heard them before. You just didn't know a Jewish girl in a concentration camp is the one that wrote them. She said things like this, Jesus did not promise to change the circumstances around us. He promised great peace and pure joy to those who would learn to believe that God actually controls all things. Here's another, in order to realize the worth of the anchor, we need to feel the stress of the storm. Here's another. The school of life offers some difficult courses, but it is in the difficult class that one learns the most. Here's another. If God sends us on stony paths, he provides strong shoes. And another. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Few of us will ever encounter trials comparable to that of Corey and Betsy. Their decision to find blessings and have a good attitude in the middle of the sewer, the filth, the beating, the persecution, the fleas, modeled what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5. He says, we too can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us. Us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Their attitude, Paul's, Corey and Betsy's, their attitude in the face of suffering is a life-changing lesson. We all have a choice when it comes to attitude. When we face the tough times and move beyond our own selfish desires and motives and pleasures, and instead we ask to experience the deeper love of God in the situation, learn how to bless others in the situation, we start finding happiness on the inside of us. We produce it. It comes from within. It is not dictated by circumstance. The Apostle Paul lived it. In Acts chapter 16, he goes to Philippi to preach the gospel. He is welcomed with beating of rods. And then they imprison him, throw him in shackles in a rat-infested dungeon. But the scripture says, while in shackles in that dungeon, he lifted up praises and began to sing praises to God. At midnight, the Bible says that the prison was shaken. Paul didn't know there was going to be an earthquake. He just had a made-up mind to choose his attitude no matter where he was he was going to give God glory. Some of us with bad attitudes believe that if we found ourselves in better circumstances, our attitude would change. It's just not true. A better situation won't change a bad attitude because an attitude is a certain way of thinking. And if your way of thinking isn't being transformed by grace, you, when the new wears off, you will still have the worst of attitudes in the best of situations. But if your mind is being renewed by Christ, you can have the best of attitudes in the worst of situations. Truth one, attitude is a choice. Truth two, your attitude isn't dictated by people or circumstances. And truth number three, I just want to drive this point home a little different. It's going a little deeper on the same topic, 
Number three, happiness is a chosen attitude, not a state of being. Some of us in this room are too young to appreciate or know Carol Burnett, who she was. She was an incredibly successful uh, comedian of years past that brought joy to millions of people. Both of her parents were alcoholics, and because of that, she grew up with her grandmother, but her grandmother didn't have an extra bedroom, so her entire growing up life... Carol Burnett slept on a humble couch in her grandmother's small home, and she studied for school under the dim light of the bathroom. But despite her circumstances, she chose to be happy, and she chose to bring that happiness to other people's lives. Some people are miserable, and they decide to make other people miserable. On the other hand, some people come out of the most difficult situations and choose happiness in the middle of those difficult circumstances. Hugh Downs is, uh, uh, you recognize his name, he's a former well-known news anchor, probably best known for his stint on ABC's 2020. Hugh is still alive, he's 98 years old. He said this, a happy person is not a person in a certain set of circumstances, but rather a person with a certain set of attitudes. Now, Dennis Waitley makes a statement about happiness, and listen, I I want you to pay attention to this, I don't know if it could be said any better. Happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. If you believe that, you're headed down a path that will lead your life to fulfillment and impact. Our culture will tell us that happiness can be bought That happiness is a destination that you travel to, that you can consume happiness, that you can wear happiness, that you can live in happiness, that you can move to happiness, that you can drive happiness. But let me be clear today, if you don't have happiness right now, you won't have happiness when you get whatever that thing is that you want, the job, the spouse, the degree, the car, the house, the vacation, whatever it is, it won't fix it. You can choose happiness at any point in your life. It is the spiritual experience of living every moment of your life with gratitude toward God. Happiness is an attitude. It is not thrust upon me. It doesn't happen to the lucky and not happen to the unlucky. It is a choice we all make. Abraham Lincoln said it this way, we are as happy as we make up our minds to be. Here's truth number five. God rewards good attitudes and disciplines bad attitudes. And so do wise parents. Because wise parents understand that you can't wait till a bad attitude becomes destructive behavior. A wise parent will discipline it while it's a bad attitude before it becomes bad behavior. Now the kids living at home that are in here today are probably not going to appreciate what I'm about to say, but I'm going to help you, okay? I'm about to help you. Um, uh, and I'm not talking just to the kids, I'm talking to all of us. How many of us ever got in trouble for rolling our eyes? Yeah, yeah. You know why we got in trouble for rolling our eyes? Because somebody loved us enough to discipline a bad attitude before it became a bad behavior. Because when you roll your eyes to someone in th- on authority, that is a disrespect for authority. That is a disrespect for whatever God has placed over your life. And you do that long enough, there's a pride that winds up slipping into your heart. And that bad attitude will ultimately become destructive behavior. So somebody was wise enough and loved you when you rolled your eyes trying to get to the attitude before it became behavior. I can't tell you. I got three kids. I can't tell you how many times every one of those kids at some point came home from school and said, I got in trouble today and I didn't do anything. Oh yeah, I bet that teacher's just laying awake asleep at night trying to figure out what five kids tomorrow can I give detention to for not doing anything. (laughs) What they meant is they didn't set the building on fire. I mean, the, the teacher most often was disciplining bad attitudes before they became destructive behaviors. God does the exact same thing. He disciplines attitudes. He is madly in love with you and nothing can change the good news of that promise. But just like any parent, he corrects attitudes before they become destructive behaviors. Listen to this. James chapter 4 verse 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride is an attitude. Humility is an attitude. God loves the proud person but he stands against the proud attitude. 
God loves you too much to let you go down a path that will destroy you. And scripture says that pride comes before the fall. So God disciplines the prideful attitude before it becomes the destructive behavior. Listen, people who don't get on to you or speak truth to you, who pat you on the back and cheer you on while you're headed towards a path of destruction, those people don't love you. People that love you will tell you the truth and your God loves you too much to not fight for you when you're going the wrong way. So he rewards good attitudes and disciplines bad attitudes. Now, just a few verses down from verse 6 in James 4, verse 10 reads this way. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. He will exalt you. He will bless you. He will honor you. God loves you and wants to bless you, which is why he disciplines bad attitudes. He wants to transform our lives and our attitudes and our ways of thinking into patterns that he can bless because that's what he wants to do. He wants to lift you and exalt you and he exalts the humble but opposes the proud. Hear me, sometimes all God is waiting on us to bless us is an attitude change in our life. The writer of Hebrews speaks about God's fatherly discipline. He talks about how he's wise and he disciplines us. Listen to this. Hebrews 12, 5 says this, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you for the Lord disciplines those he loves. The the King James says he chastens the ones he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Verse 7, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you are not really his children at all. It's a pretty strong message. Now, My grandfather had his own unique way of discipline. I guess it was from his generation. We have a phrase that we call it being taken to the woodshed. You know, that means somebody's going to get wore out when they're being taken to the woodshed. And for some of you, that's just a phrase. For me, it was real life. My grandpa literally did take us to the woodshed. I mean, we went out by, he'd say, son, get out behind the woodshed. And he literally took us out behind the shop, out behind the shed. And and sometimes it was a willow switch that we had to pick. Sometimes it was a leather horse bridle that was laying on a table or a belt that he took off. Sometimes it was an engine belt that he just had laying around there. I'm telling you, I, I would have been in the protective services if, I, if, they, if they had known how he had disciplined me. He just couldn't get away with some of that today. He, he, and, and the entire time my grandfather would be wearing me out behind the woodshed, he would be crying. I mean, tears in his eyes saying, I'm doing this, son, because I love you. And I would be thinking, you got a strange way of showing it. But he would literally, he would cry. I'm like, look, we can talk about this. We can reason this. We don't have to go there. I'm doing this because I love you. And this, this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's a father. He chastens the ones he loves. And if you haven't felt the discipline of the Lord lately, I mean, he, he's asking you, have you been to the woodshed lately? Because he disciplines the one he loves. And if you haven't felt God's conviction lately, and you hadn't felt his correction lately, and you haven't felt his discipline lately, you need to ask some real serious questions about your relationship with God. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say this in verse 12 in this conversation about the Lord's discipline. At the end of that, he says this, therefore lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Okay, he's talking about body posture. Remember a moment ago, we we talked about how body posture often reflects somebody's attitude towards something. And in this particular context, these people were incredibly discouraged by what they were going through and their body posture, their drooping hands and their weak knees were reflective of being uh, broken in their attitude. They had a broken spirit. It was a broken attitude reflected in their body posture, okay? 
And I've seen the 21st century of this, uh, the 21st century example of this. My kids are older now, but don't, don't let them fool you. They can still have moments like these. I can't tell you how many times I've seen my kids having fun at something. Uh, they're enjoying themselves, whatever they're doing. And then we get this phone call that company's coming over last minute and the house isn't up to Haley's par. So she's running around telling everybody, make your bed, pick up your toys, clean the living room. And we're running crazy. She's running crazy. We're barking out orders to the kids and, and, and they'll say, we'll say, put, get off the game, you know, PlayStation, turn off the TV. And they say something like this, we'll do it later. I'm in the middle of a game. Okay. How many, how many of you heard that? I'm in the middle of a game. Okay. We'll do it later. Not, not right now, in just a moment. And so we patiently give them a few minutes, a few more times before the hammer drops and we start threatening them. You know, come on, we don't want to do this. Uh, but, but if you don't stop what you're doing right now and jump in and start pitching in, and then there's absolutely nothing. And so they're in there doing this. And you walk in and say... You're grounded for the next 14 days from your phone and every minute you stay in here and don't listen to what I'm saying, I'm gonna add time to it and they're gonna other things that are gonna go into this if you don't get up and here's what they do. They're all happy doing what they wanna do and here's what they do. God. <laughs> Drooping hands and weak knees. Well, the Lord, it's the same with us. He disciplines the one he loves. And he says, you're living with unforgiveness. Oh, God, you don't know what they did to me. He loves you too much to let an unforgiving heart destroy your life. So he keeps lovingly disciplining you and convicting you, confronting you. And just like with my kids, the discipline will end when the lesson is learned. Here's number five. Attitudes predict destiny. Which is why John Maxwell in that little eloquent statement about attitude a moment ago said that attitude is the speaker of our present and the prophet of our future. Good attitudes proceed and predict favor, fulfillment, and impact, while bad attitudes proceed and predict disfavor, unfulfillment, and lack of impact. So let's go back to that aviation definition a moment ago and talk about that attitude indicator on an airplane for a moment. Here's what it looks like. And I've never been a pilot, but I've flown in a lot of small planes and had pilots flying me certain places, and it's one of the most important instruments a pilot has especially when visibility is low. Now, I knew they had altitude indicators, but I didn't know there was an attitude indicator. But when visibility is low and the pilot can't see outside with a naked eye, when it's cloudy, dark, foggy, whatever, the attitude indicator tells you if the plane is nose up in attitude, nose level in attitude, or nose down in attitude. Obviously, if it is nose level, you're cruising. If it's nose up, you're climbing. If it's nose down, you're either landing or you are crashing. So when you can't see outside, you're in what a pilot would call an IFR, instrument flight rule. They have to trust their instrument, their instruments. They can't trust their gut. They can't trust their, their instincts. They have to go by their instruments. And there are times in our lives when we can't see clearly. There are horrible circumstances that have clouded our view, that have surrounded us. And when that happens to a pilot, they, if they start trusting their emotions instead of their instrument, if they start trusting their emotions instead Instead of their attitude indicator, they will get confused and fly the plane straight into the ground. That's how John F. Kennedy Jr. died. He didn't trust his instruments and he was flying over the ocean with little to no visibility. He lost his visual reference thinking he was flying level the entire time. He had a nose down attitude and flew the plane as a perfectly good plane flown directly into the ocean. He thought he was level the entire time. Your inner ear will lie to you when you are flying. Even a good pilot who thinks they're doing well can get what is called the leans. And the leans are when you barely have one wing tipped a certain direction in your head, in your emotion, inside 
beside you, the plane is level, but it is tilted just a little bit. And what happens is the plane will actually fly in circles in that situation until it flies all the way to the ground and crashes. You think everything is good, and it is, except one slight tilt of the wing. When you're going through difficulty in life, you have to trust your instrument. And the instrument for us is Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. The Word of God is the attitude indicator. It is what you measure your life against. I don't care what the pop psychologist says. I don't care what Oprah and Dr. Phil say. I don't care what the Grammy say, the Oscars say. I don't care what anybody say. You measure your life against the attitude indicator of the Word of God. And when you're out of balance, against that, regardless of how you feel, you better correct based on what that instrument says. Repetitively, God's word tells us, put our eyes on him. He can transform us. His word is our attitude indicator. And by hanging on to his promises, we can live a nose up life in a nose down world. We can keep climbing even when it's so dark outside that we cannot see our hand in front of our face. Our attitude is everything, and our attitude is our way of thinking, and our way of thinking should be being transformed by the work of God's grace in our life. Our mind should be being renewed because of God's activity in our life. Now, let me leave you with this. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says this, let this mind be in you, which was also In Christ Jesus, mind, way of thinking. Let me just point this out. Here's how the New Living Translation translates that. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And what was that? What kind of attitude did he have? Well, if you, we don't have time to run it out, but if you were to go on and read the rest of that passage, that's that passage that says he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He did not consider it... uh, Equality with God, something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. He became a man. What, what, what is that attitude? It's, a, it's an attitude of selflessness, an attitude of humility, an attitude of obedience, an attitude where the mission of God was of a greater priority than his personal wants. And like Isaiah said, he was a lamb led to a slaughter and he kept silent. He never said a word. He did not complain, not one time. Not one time in the scripture when Jesus was facing his troubles and his trials and his persecution, not one time when he lived out what Philippians 2 refers to did he complain or have a bad attitude. He kept his mouth silent and he was offering love and grace and blessing to people along the way while hanging on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He said to the thief on one side of him, today you will be with me in paradise. Like Betsy and Corey, he was offering blessing in the middle of persecution. Let the same attitude be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You say, well, pastor, how do I, how do I get from where I am to that kind of life? And, and, and I understand that question. I have people in my life, you know, I'm a, I'm a realist. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm a man of faith, and when I get my head wrapped around it in faith, I'll jump off a cliff if I think God told me to. I, 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 have, a, I have a great degree of faith, but when, when something comes up, I am a realist. What I mean by that is, for me, faith is not the denial of reality. I want to know all the hard facts. I don't want to be an ostrich. I don't want to stick my head in the ground. If I'm sick, I'm not going to walk around and hide that I'm sick and call that faith. I'm going to call myself sick, and I'm going to say God has the power to change that. Faith isn't denial of reality. Faith is being very real about what. And because I'm a realist with faith, sometimes my most immediate response, because I want to know all the hard facts. I I want to know all the difficult things. Tell, Tell me everything. And sometimes I see all the hard facts and I, ha- I start out with a really bad attitude because I'm overwhelmed by the reality of it. Now, because of my faith and a little bit some time to process, I'm able to come to the place of having a better attitude. But I know there, there are people in my life who they can see the same reality that I see and immediately, not fake, but immediately have an incredible attitude in the face of the same reality. They're just wired that way, and they have disciplined themselves to that way of thinking. 
And I want to be more like that. I want to grow in that area. And when I get around them, it makes me want to be more like them. And I was thinking, Lord, how do I grow in that area? And how do people that are listening to me grow in that area? And I think it's, 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 it's our part and there's God's part. And there's a part of this is just a sheer will. You choose your attitude. You can choose happiness in any situation. God can't choose that for you. You have to make up your mind that you're going to walk out of this room and you're going to find something to be grateful for in every situation. Happiness is the spiritual experience of finding goodness and being grateful to God in any situation of life. That you got to have the will to choose to do that. But then on the other side of that, there is this supernatural work. That metamorphosis we talked about, Paul mentioned in Romans 12. God will transform you, renewing your mind. As you surrender to him, you can only do so much. But there's this supernatural help that is promised from God that he will morph you. There will be a metamorphosis, a rewiring of your brain, a new way of thinking. You and I, I'm, Lord, I don't want to take on the copy and the patterns and behaviors of the world and the people around me. I don't want this negative attitude. I don't want this bad attitude. I'm going to choose to find something to be grateful for in the worst of situations, an act of your will. But then I'm going to surrender to you and trust You're going to renew my mind. You're going to change my way of thinking. This supernatural help from God. There's your part and there's his part. Here's what I want us to do today. I I do want, when we stand in just a moment, I want our prayer team to be able to, to be here to serve you. Because for some of us it is dark. It's cloudy in our lives right now. And we need somebody to pray with us about a a family situation, a a job situation, there is, a, there is something that prompts the bad attitudes and the bitterness. And the, there are things going on in our life. Maybe you've recently gotten a diagnosis from a doctor and you need prayer for healing or you need a miracle of provision financially or a miracle of restoration in a home or a relationship. I want our team to be ready to pray with you today and just trust God to do the miraculous in your life. But we're going to keep the environment worshipful over the next few moments because some of us may need just to sit here and have a moment of resolve. God, I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose differently. I know I see the worst in every situation and I'm going to discipline myself to find something to be grateful for in every situation. Did you you hear how um, in that statement I read to you where Corey after they made their gratitude list, she called them God's fleas. <laughs> you have to discipline yourself to a new way of thinking. And I just encourage you to let this be a moment of resolve. Make a choice, but then know it's not all about you. As you say, you surrender more to Him. He's going to come and give you the strength rewire, transform your patterns of thinking. He will renew your mind. Would you stand with me all over this place today? And prayer team, would you make yourself available this morning? I want to pray for us today. And I know we could all use some help in this area. um, But I want to pray a blessing over your life in the process. Father, Would you make these altars a place where miracles happen? A place where Jesus is glorified because of the active work of God in our lives as we pray the prayer of faith. We trust you today. Trust you to move in families. We trust you to move in marriages. We we trust you to move in situations that seem impossible. And as people come forward for prayer, that alone is an act of faith. And God, would you respond to that faith today and bring glory to your name through the needs of people. There are some folks, Lord, that are just going to remain standing or turn and kneel or be seated right where they are as a response to this word. They, they know that the word has been spoken and the spirit is dealing with their hearts and they want to change. So, Lord, today we're going to make a choice in our own will to be grateful in all things. But God, we know that that's not enough. Would you rewire our brain? 
Would you transform us? Give us new ways of thinking. Would you change our attitude today? Father, would you bless them and keep them? Would you make your face shine down upon them? Would you be gracious to them? Turn your countenance their direction today and God, would you grant them peace? And out of that peace, may out of that wholeness, that shalom of God, may a new way of thinking emerge. Out of that security, may a good attitude emerge. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open. God bless you.